Well, hello, Coast Hills and friends. Welcome to another online service here at Coast Hills Community Church, where we aspire to be a Jesus-centered community, creating gracious space through acts of generous love. Today, we're going to look at this question, are, you, are we biblical, Bible-centered or are we Jesus-centered? Are we Bible-centered or Jesus-centered? And the answer, well, hopefully I'll answer the, that question at the end of this sermon. See, our aspiration statement says this. We are a Jesus-centered community creating gracious space through acts of generous love. I want to give you a little history of this aspiration statement. It came out of the meeting of over seven years ago uh, when I started becoming lead pastor here. I thought we need to get people together to uh, help um, give values to who we want to become or who we are as a church as well. And so over 40 people came together for a waffle breakfast uh, and we took some time to pray, to listen to one another, and to listen to the Holy Spirit regarding who we wanted to be as a church. We had some from our conference, someone from our conference uh, help us walk through um, understanding our past, understanding where we were at in the present age at that time, and then to help shape who we wanted to be in the future. It was a very healthy and energizing meeting. Um, and our leadership team was there um, as well, and so we were there jotting things down. We had lots of sticky notes, and uh, not even sticky notes, just lots of uh, pieces of paper. We heard everyone, and then what happened was we took that information uh, back about three weeks later, our leadership team and uh, spouses met, and then we listened to one another, and we said, how, what, how we wanted to decipher what we were hearing from the community, and we came up with this aspiration statement. <clears throat> and so, over the last seven years, I've had different people ask me this question that I want to address today. Why don't you say that you are a Bible-centered church? If you go on some people's uh, websites, other churches, they say that they're Bible-centered. But you don't say you're Bible-centered, you say you're Jesus-centered. And then I can tell them that in a sense that we are Bible-centered church without saying it overtly. And what I want to try to express is that we uh, preach from the Bible every single week. <clears throat> and as we do that, we try to understand and grapple with and wrestle with, well, how does that, how might the Bible impact our daily lives? But we interpret it, we interpret the Bible through a Jesus-centered lens. So we're, in a sense, the Bible is filtered through a Jesus-centered lens. That is why we say we are a Jesus-centered community. Although it's the Bible where we get all our information about who Jesus is, if that makes sense. Now, the Bible is a beautifully complicated book. <laughs> God inspired real people to write the Bible. Over 40 different authors from different walks of life, including farmers, fishermen, prophets, um, physicians, um, and shepherds. And the Bible was written, our Christian Bible, was written over 1,500 years and then compiled together. There are many different literary uh, styles in the Bible, from prose to poetry to myth to law codes to historical narrative to teaching narrative to parables to wisdom literature and miracle stories. And of the two billion Christians worldwide, there are also 45,000 different Christian denominations or traditions who interpret the Bible differently. So here we are, our little slice of the kingdom of God, the church in Cloverdale, that we say that we are a Jesus-centered community, creating gracious space through acts of generous love. And so we need to, our community needs to interpret the Bible and, and, and then how does it affect our lives in that way? This book that is, again, like I said, quite complicated, 
but beautifully complicated because God chose to use a variety of different people to, to speak, to write his inspired word for us to understand what it means to follow him, for us to understand who God is, who we are, and our place in our lives, and yet we need to take some time to interpret what it means for us in our culture today. This is the beauty of the Bible. That it wasn't just written by one person down, saying that it was downloaded to, from God, but a variety of different people. <clears throat> and we also know in the midst of this that the Bible has been used in the past for terrible things. Uh, to justify slavery, to justify segregation, residential schools, racism, patriarchy, oppression, uh, oppression of women, um, wars, and the list goes on and on. If you read the Bible, you need to interpret the Bible. Yet, some things can be at their face value, some things, but but most of it, you need to try to grapple with and understand it. In, in fact, the Old Testament, the Jewish Bible, if you talk to any uh, um, Jewish rabbi, they'll say the intent with the Bible is that we wrestle in community what is it to what it means for us today. And so the Bible itself was written in, with a culture and a people and a religious tradition that, um, that had varying different um, interpretations and varying different people to wrestle with what it meant for them. That's really what it means. In fact, the word Israel, the Jewish people's names, Israel, it comes from uh, where, where Jacob was wrestling with an angel of God and, the, and was given the name Israel, which means one who wrestles with God. And now we are the people of God. We are the ones who wrestle with God in what it means to live a life faithfully following a God who faithfully calls us to himself all the time and redirects us, comforts us, and cares for us, reminds us that we are a called out people to live differently in a world that is all about and usually about self-preservation. And so, if we read the Bible, you need to interpret the Bible. And what does that mean for us? How does this affect my life or our life as a community in this way? You see, we don't worship the Bible. We worship and we follow Jesus. We don't worship and follow the Bible. The first century church, they didn't necessarily have it. Well, actually, the Bible that they had was the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament. But Jesus repeatedly forced them to reinterpret the Old Testament in light of who he was. You see Jesus doing this all the time in the Gospels. He says, you've heard that it was said, but I say to you. It, it is written, but I say. And then yet Jesus doesn't come to dismantle it, but he, he says there was... There was hints of me all along. There were shadows of me all along in the Old Testament. And yet now I'm the full revelation of God and now I'm going to help you reinterpret into a trajectory that now we live in the, with Jesus as our Lord and Savior in the kingdom of God that is for all people of earth. That we are to live in, underneath this rule and reign of Jesus. In January and February of, uh, of 2023, so uh, la about a year and a half ago, or just over a year and a half ago, I did a five-part series on this uh, theme, and it was called Focal Point, Reading the Bible Through the Lens of Jesus. And so if you want to take a deeper dive uh, into that, you can view my sermons. Um, I would actually say they're probably my best sermons, as well as they drill down into this topic more, um, more deeply and clearly. Uh, and I would say that they reflect who we are as Coast Hills. Um, 
some of the sermons, five part series, probably seven part series, but because we meet at the ministry center um, uh, once a month, I believe we only recorded five of those. But they look at the Ethiopian eunuch and how the Ethiopian Ethiopian I can't even talk. Ethiopian eunuch was able to be baptized and then sent off as a leader uh, to be able to uh, ch- plant a church. That would have been unheard of before Jesus. We talk about the, t- the tearing of the um, curtain in the temple. Why was that significant? Talk about Jesus breaking Sabbath laws, which was actually a definition of who the people of God were, and now Jesus is, is breaking laws. And because he's breaking laws, um, some of the Jewish leaders at that time then wanted to kill Jesus. What in the world? Jesus is going against the Old Testament, going against the rules and the laws that were there, or actually is he not going against them? Is he actually reinterpreting the way that they should have been reinterpreted? They should have been interpreted all along. We look at, in that five-part series, Focal Point, reading the Bible through the lens of Jesus, we look at what does the day of vengeance look like for Jesus? It might surprise you. So I want to encourage you to go look at this. Today we're just going to touch on this topic. So our text today comes from Hebrews 1, 1 to 4. It says this, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophet, met prophets many times and in various ways. But in these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through him also made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. This is he's talking about Jesus. So Jesus became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inher- inherited is superior to theirs. Meaning the Christ. The one. The Lord. So what this is saying, the scripture is saying, in other parts that I, I, I'm tempted to, to, to say all these scriptures, but I want to just use one for today. What, what the Bible here is telling us ourselves here, right? The Bible itself is saying, the New Testament is saying, listen, God used to, did speak to us before in, through our ancestors and our prophets, talking about Moses and and. Uh, the prophet who, who then wrote the scriptures, David, who wrote the Psalms, God spoke to us this way, but now, in these last days, God has spoken this to us even more clearly through the person of Jesus, who is the full manifestation of who God is. See, Jesus is the visible picture of the invisible God. If you want to understand who God is, we look to Jesus. And yes, Jesus was a single um, man who lived 33 years on planet Earth as a Jew in a certain time, 2,000 years ago. And, and so we understand God to be God's character through, lived out through Jesus himself. And so here the Bible itself is saying, you need to listen to Jesus. Jesus has all authority, even above the angels. And I would say, even above the scripture. And so, when we say, are we biblical, are we Bible-centered, are we Jesus-centered, it's kind of chicken in the egg kind of thing. We learn Jesus, we learn of Jesus through the scriptures. But we wouldn't have the New Testament without Jesus. We wouldn't have the interpretation of the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus without Jesus. We wouldn't be Christian without Jesus. And so Jesus gives us uh, gives us an understanding of this complicated book that we call the Bible. Um, Sharon and I had a 
beautiful privilege of meeting with Peter and Diane Nickel on Friday. Uh, Peter is in hospice. He's, in a sense, uh, living his last days. And um, it was full of joy. There was lots of laughter. Uh, but in the midst of it, uh, I was asking him some questions, and, and, and I won't share exactly what we were talking about because I don't want to infringe on some personal things. But, but Peter, I, was, I was mentally writing down a few things because Peter still has a lot to teach us. And as Peter was reflecting on who God is, uh, in the person of Jesus, uh, Peter uh, made this statement. He said, Kevin, the Bible that is so ancient and it's been around for so long, but we are continually learning new stuff about Jesus from it. I wonder if that is because we have a hard time learning to be Christ-like. Wow, Peter, you see, the Bible is really simple when it comes to, hey, an eye for an eye. Or if someone has done this to him, get a stone and stone it. It's easy to be vengeful. It's easy to um, to to want to treat people um, the way that we would want. But it gets a little more complicated and harder. And I would actually say even more beautiful if we are to live in a way that Jesus has called us to live, the way that Jesus called. Now, we don't do it perfectly, but we do try to do it faithfully. And that is the more beautiful way to live in the world, to steward the world in the world, to live as Jesus lived. And yes, Peter, I think it is because we have a hard time learning what it means to be Christ-like. But God, through his Holy Spirit, and through the community of people, gently nudges us to be more and more Christ-like in a world that looks more and more selfish, in a world that looks more and more violent. He calls us to be more and more peaceful, more and more uh, forgiving, more and more gracious, that we would live out what the kingdom of God looks like, and the kingdom of God is ruled and reigned by the person of of Jesus Christ, who is the full manifestation of who God is. So Jesus forces us not only to do what the Bible says, but to live a life of love that looks more and more like Jesus. <clears throat> I'm grateful that our little church is part of the MB denomination. Like I said before, there's 45 different 45,000 different denominations. And I just had a ministerial meeting on, um, on Wednesday where I met with, we met with uh, about 12 different churches in Cloverdale. They're all different denominations. And I talked to my friend Ian, who's a, the pastor at the Lutheran Church. I said, Ian, isn't it wonderful that we can all just get along here? I used to have a problem with the denominations and why can't we just understand where it all is? Well, you know what? It, it, it is, everyone needs a home. Everyone needs a place to call home in their a f a faith home. And Ian said, yeah, like, like as long as we don't come here and say we know what's right and you're wrong and you're a heretic and you aren't and, and what does it mean? So, so we, as a ministerial, we've learned to lay down our denominational swords to then be able to say we are all followers of Jesus here. And yes, we don't agree theologically. We don't agree maybe even politically or culturally. Um, but we agree right now that Jesus is the one that we're trying to understand to live faithfully towards. And that might look differently for others. And that's a beautiful thing. So, but we're part of the Mennonite Brethren. And one of the Mennonite Brethren has, um, we have what's called a confession of faith that we live in. Um, and... Um, and we live into. And this is a confession of faith, the U.S. and Canadian conferences of Mennonite Brethren Churches. And um, this was written, this is a 1999 edition, meaning that they, they rewrote some of the things in 1999. And what the confession of faith does is it tries to make sense of what this Bible is saying as a denominator. We, like I said, we wrestle together as a community. What does this mean? How do we live this out? And so our denomination says, okay, we're con confessional. And, and there's, uh, uh, how many, like, uh, 
18 different articles on articles on different topics. So God, the revelation of God, creation in humanity, sin and evil, salvation, nature of the church, mission and church, Christian baptism, Lord's Supper, disciple, it goes on and on. And I, what I want to look at today is um, article number two of what our denomination, because it gives a good understanding of this kind of, are we Bible-centered or are we Jesus-centered? The answer is, I'll answer you now, yes. <clears throat> it says this, we believe that God has made himself to be uh, known to all people. God's power and nature have always been evident in creation. The Old Testament reveals God as the one who established a covenant relationship with Israel to make known to all people the eternal plan of salvation. God revealed himself supremely in Jesus Christ as recorded in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit continues to make God known to individuals and the church. This revelation is always consistent with the scriptures. We believe that the entire Bible was inspired by God through the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit guides the community of faith in the interpretation of Scripture. The person, teachings, and life of Jesus Christ bring continuity and clarity to both the Old and the New Testaments. The Old Testament bears witness to Christ, and Christ is the one whom the New Testament proclaims. We accept the Bible as the infallible Word of God the authoritative guide for faith and practice. Okay, we're using words like infallibility, authoritative, um, the revelation of God is always consistent with scriptures, but we have to interpret those scriptures, and then we have to agree on what it means. And guess what? We don't always agree. We agree, agree on some of the macro things, but we can wrestle with what it is. In fact, there is a new uh, version out uh, that came out, and this, I believe, Eve is revised article 8, which is on baptism, 2021. Because language changes. And the, the people of God wrestle with it. Now, not a lot of changes are made in this. And this here, if you look at this, this is a little bit, this is the smaller, this is the version. Then as pastors, they give us a bigger version that has um, application, a pastoral application and interpretation. And so I'm just saying, the be, it, some might say, well, that's like crazy. I'm like, no, this is, this is the people of God wrestling with what it means to be Jesus followers. We're taking the Bible, trying to distill it down into uh, a confession. Then we're taking the confession, trying to interpret it, and we're having conversations with one another in this way. Um, there's a focal point uh, sermon that I did in 2003 that I mentioned that talks about in Acts 15 where they did just that as a community. They had to interpret what it means because of Jesus. And all I'm saying is that what a beautiful picture that we as a people of God, especially the denom denomination of Mennonite Brethren, we are in this rich heritage that we listen to one another. It's not just what Kevin says. We allow questions to be on the table, and we need to wrestle with those questions in order to continue to be the people of God. And so Coast Hills is part of this tradition that listens to others, particularly when it comes to the interpretation of the Holy Scriptures. And the community keeps reminding each other, you need to look like Jesus. You need to interpret the Scriptures through Jesus. Jesus changes everything and even your interpretation of the Bible. So, friends, are we a Jesus-centered community or a Bible-centered community? The answer is yes. So, I want to encourage you, if you haven't, come visit us for a little while and be the judge if we are or we aren't. As we live into this statement we are a Jesus-centered community creating gracious space through acts of generous love. Friends, I hope that this has helped spur you on to think in this way. I hope you also understand and know that, that Jesus is with you. I want to um, quote one more thing from Peter. Some of us might be at different times wondering about what does this faith mean and 
uh, might have questions and, and, um, and you're, you're trying to do the right thing and, and, the and sometimes it can get exhausting trying to be religious. I want to encourage you that in the midst of being religious, you are a human spiritual person. And that God in the person of Jesus has come to this world to reveal himself to you in a God that's going to look more gracious and more wide and more expansive and more loving, more forgiving than any other God in the person of Jesus. And this is the beautiful picture of the, of the gospel of Jesus for you. And you might be thinking, how do I hold on to this? What does it look like? Well, Peter, and I wrote this down, Peter said this, he says, you know, Kevin, Peter right now, people are telling me to hold on to God. But he says, the grace of, the grace of God is that God is holding on to me, even when it seems like sometimes I'm letting go of God. <laughs> Friends, that is a beautiful way to interpret the Bible. That God is not letting go of you. And in the person of Jesus, he's revealing more and more of his beauty. That a God who came to the world to pursue, to live among us and with us, to empathize with us, to sit with us, and to lead us in a way everlasting. Friends, May you be encouraged in that way to be a Jesus-centered community. If you have questions, come, check us out, ask us. We'd love to lead you and maybe sit with you and help uh, you in your spiritual journey. Let's pray. God, thank you. Jesus, thank you for revealing yourself to us at just the right moment. We have all kinds of questions about that, but we realize that. Thank you for the way that you've um, helped us interpret Scripture in a way that looks more and more like you. Oh God, would you meet us where we're at? And like Peter, would we understand that you are holding on to us even though we sometimes let go of you? Teach us what that means. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. What a beautiful name. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus.
Well, friends, I want to leave you with this benediction, uh, this ancient benediction that is found in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy, actually, it says this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Until next time, friends. Peace to you. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing Your name is life Break every stronghold Shine through the shadows Cause I know that
there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Thank you. 